Hi, everyone, and welcome to the Queer Robbery. And I'm going to hand over to Damien Bonson now. Next slide, please. Um, hello, everybody. My name's Damien Bonson. I'm the founder of Black Rainbow. Uh, welcome to Queer Robbery 3, the third in our series. Uh, the previous two are available on our website at blackrainbow.org.au. Um, in addition to the MP, MHPN's acknowledgement, um, as a First Nations person um, from the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples from the Catherine region and also from the Western um, Islands in the Torres Strait, I'd like to also acknowledge um, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islanders' um, elders past and present, those that are joining us today and those on the lands in which we all work and operate. Um, special mention to the, um, because this is a, I guess, a queer focused um, session is also to my queer brothers and sisters and non-binary folk out there as well to acknowledge them um, and their day to day efforts. Thank you. Thanks, Damien. Next slide, please. Uh, so as you can see, and as you already had in the information you would have received ahead of time, this webinar is a fantastic collaboration between Black Rambo, which is an organisation run by Damien Bonson. And sorry for the confusion, there's two Damien's, there's me, Damien Riggs and Damien Bonson, and the MHPN. And so this is our third webinar, and we've got another one coming up in September. Uh, and this is research today that Damien's going to be talking about research that was led by MediDate, that he was part of, that's focused on suicide-related behaviour. Next slide, please. So Damien's already introduced himself, but I'm sure he'll say a little bit more in a minute. I'm Damien Riggs. I'm a non-Indigenous professor in psychology at Flinders University. I'm also a psychotherapist. I'm here today on the unceded lands of the Ghana people, and I acknowledge their sovereignty as First Nations people. Damien, would you like to introduce yourself, please, and tell us a bit about Maddie as well? Yeah, hi, everybody. Um, I'm up here on Larrakia country. Uh, my great-grandmother is actually from the Jowan people, which is just outside of Catherine. Um, she was immortalised in the film Weird the Never Never as Bet Bet the Little Black Princess and also I have family that come from the Torres Strait. Uh, Maddie Day, uh, they are the lead researcher on this. They, um, Macquarie University is one of our key partners. Um, what Black Rainbow has engaged in over the years is kind of like some um, queer First Nations um, nation building um, by creating partnerships with other First Nations queer folk in the areas of the work that um, needs to be undertaken. And uh, Maddie was also the lead for our COVID study, which was the subject of our first queer operary. And they have um, they, they were the lead on this bit of work as well. Thanks, Damien. So again, you've already had this information up front, but just to reiterate, we're, David's going to be talking through the findings of a, a, a project that he was involved in, and we're really going to sort of map out, or Damien's going to map out, sorry, what that looks like and what the implications are for our practice. Next slide, please. Thanks, Damien, um, for the introduction and the beginning of this. Uh, this report um, really was born out of the anecdotal and lived experience of First Nations queer folk. There has been a paucity of research and data in, into our lives um, across all the domains um, that affect um, all Australians. And what we had known and, and picked up on as First Nations queer folk is that discrimination and violence that targets us as Aboriginal and LGBTI people have a significant impact on our employment opportunities, um, our access to healthcare, the types of healthcare that we need, housing, and even just participating in our own communities, whether that is First Nations communities, LGBTI communities, but also in the broader um, Australian community. And what we found as well, and what we've experienced is that violence, that discrimination, that marginalisation has also excluded a lot of us from community, which also means a separation from country um, and culture, which is a significant risk for our, us as um, First Nations people around our social, cultural and emotional well-being. Um, one of the, the two significant, I guess, uh, take homes from this or recommendations was that for us as a population, that's the Aboriginal, lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender, queer, intersex, asexual, non-binary, um, sister, girl and brother boy populations as a priority group around research and policy and programs to address and to identify some of those challenges that we have in the face of this violence. Um, and we are also, as a population group, that we're empowered and um, resourced to be able to provide um, the responses so they, they can be First Nations LGBTQI-led. Just a thing on the initialism, those letters that you will see, they will 
they're going to be interchangeable throughout the presentation. This this language, all these initials, these letters, um, they're quite fluid and different organisations and entities use a different sequencing, but they all mean the same thing. Next slide, please. For historically, when um, demographic deep data has been collected and statistics for First Nations people, they've been um, limited to a binary of either being male or female or as man or woman. What that has done is that has obstructed any of the data and research to really unpack and uncover um, what is the suicide-related behaviour that is related to those of us that don't identify under that um, binary structure um, of identification. And the gender diversity also then does not get picked up um, in any kind of coronial inquests, uh, particularly around um, suicide and self-harming. Next question. Next slide, please. It's um, only just recently that uh, policy regarding the health and well-being for our community um, has kind of materialised. Um, slowly, we've been working towards growing a critical mass of, um, of data and kind of footnotes in, in uh, reports. I think one of the earliest ones outside of HIV was in the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Suicide Prevention Evaluation Project. We are slowly we've been since that was in 2016, so it's been a, it's been a minute. Um, we are seeing ourselves in other reports now, but where we're at is that without the data, there cannot be any. Um, what's the word here, um, activation of, of that note. So the, while the high risk has been noted in these reports, there's no data to support that. Therefore, there is nothing there to be able to create a policy around what interventions need to go to next. This is really important um, in terms of the risk factors that we do face in our lives around strengthening um, services to be able to better engage with us as a community, but also first and foremost, identify that as a population group, we should be using your services uh, because of the significant high risk across a number of um, social domains that affect our lives. Um, so David, I'm, I'm really interested, David, before we move on, actually, it's you know eight years since you made that submission. Where are things going? Where do you think they should be going? I, I honestly believe that we do need a First Nations LGBTQI health strategy in place. Um, the Commonwealth has announced a 10-year ten-year plan and an investment in a 10-year plan for the LGBTI community. Um, I understand that a new social emotional being framework um, for the First Nations community uh, population is also about to get announced or, or is in start development. What happens is that currently or to date we don't really get a look in at both so there's either lgbti work that gets done that doesn't include us in any substantive way and same with the aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander health work as well i firmly believe that we need to have a starting point and that starting point is to be a first nations lgbtqti strategy to actually to supplement and to complement those two larger strategies Without that body of work, I fear that it will be the, the status quo will remain and we will be continuing to be overlooked as a population group of, um, of high need. Thanks, David. Over the next few slides will, will be the um, some of the real key points um, that were brought out um, from, from the report, in particular, as um, First Nations people, um, First Nations LGBTQTI people, through the research to date, and this is only in the last three or four years, it's recognised that we have high rates of mental health problems um, than non-LGBTQTI, um, First Nations LGBTQTI people. So that's Indigenous people who aren't LGBTQTI and then also non-Indigenous LGBTQTI people as well. Um, this all goes a hand with this goes hand in hand with higher levels of um, discrimination, violence, and abuse because we can experience it both as a race uh, racist abuse, excuse me, also as some um, homophobic, biophobic, transphobic type of violence as well. Excuse me. 
This then also has a flow on effect where housing security becomes an issue. Um, we have, we are known to coming out through the research that there are high risks for homelessness, but also for experiencing poverty. Um, and that's just not just around housing and security. That's around employment opportunities and having an income coming in as well. Um, we it's noted in several studies now that have come out in the last three years that Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander LGBTQTI plus SB people are less likely to use mental health services. Largely that's because from the outside looking in, they don't say you are welcome here. And I think that's a significant step for, for, for services to do is to, to create a space that from the outside looking in says you are welcome here, come through these doors. And um, what we what's I think about to be uh, re come out in some data. Um, we do have some the preliminary stuff through this research, but and also through the COVID study um, that as a population group, and this is in line with um, the United States, um, American Indian and Alaska Native data, um, that we are more likely to attempt suicide as a population group than any population group in the country. So in the US, American um, Natives, and so American Indians and Alaska Native people, uh, as LGBTQTI people, are the highest risk group and the highest, uh, more likely to attempt suicide than any other American. Um, and that's 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 what we're mirroring here in Australia. Uh, next slide, please. Despite the, um, the you know the trauma and the marginalisation and, and discrimination that we experience, this report also brings out the um, how important the connection to community and culture as a protective factor comes into play. And this is where family is really important. Um, we know in the LGBTI data anyway that comes out that um, family is one of, an acceptance by family is one of the greatest protective factors for self-harming and suicide for LGBTQI folk. That is also the same for First Nations LGBTI people. One, that family is also a buffer. An acceptance of our um, diverse sex, sexuality and gender diversity, acceptance of that also provides a barrier to racism through our families as well. So without that acceptance and without the family around us, not only just, um, you know, accept us as queer folk, but to protect us from that homophobia, that family also provides a barrier for us for, for rape protection against racism as well. So once that, if the family unit isn't there for us, we are left up kind of unshielded um, from both racism and homophobia. Um, next slide, please. Um, we, because of the, I guess the, the societal levels of um, racism and homophobia, we, we, we have to navigate those on a daily basis, um, not just in service access, but it's imperative when it comes to accessing services that these services, as I mentioned a couple of slides ago, from the outside looking in saying, you are welcome through these front doors. Our service is for you. Um, I remember when I was a, in Scott, in a, a teenager, um, a teenager gay, um, gay guy, um, when I was about 18 or 19, I was living in Western Australia. And I remember for the first time seeing a bookshop. So this is going back to the late 80s, early 90s, seeing a bookstore with the rainbow flag on it. And I'm a bit of a nerd. And I thought, I knew by seeing that flag on the window, there are going to be books in that bookstore about me. It's something as simple as that. So that flag, that icon got me through that front door. And that's something really simple that, you know, to increase and, and to, to provide a sense of um, trust in a service just to even get through that front door is something simple as a bit of iconography or, or just some messaging to say that First Nations queer folk, you are welcome here. And I think that, you know, Damien, this is a wonderful part about this report is that it does that work of highlighting the discrimination and marginalisation, but also the resiliency. I think too often, you know, and, and Tuck wrote that fantastic paper almost 15 years ago saying, you know, research on Indigenous communities is so often damage centred when it's created by researchers who are not themselves Indigenous. But when we have research created by Indigenous people, and in this case, Indigenous LGBTIQA plus people, you know, it really, it does that important work of looking at marginalisation, but also saying, hey, we're also agentic, we're resilient, we have strength, we, we achieve things in the face of this discrimination. 
Look, absolutely. And it's one of the things for Black Rainbow for us is that we don't want to present ourselves as a group that is constantly on the on the end of homophobia or racism and that's our life, even though that's that is you know often the reality for us. But in presenting that outwardly, um I always thought, well, what does it what does that look like for us? How will people then perceive who we are if we constantly present ourselves as a marginalized, as a uh, discriminated against group? Where are they going to be able to, to see our agency, to see how empowered we are and to see our resilience in the face of all this? And so we don't use it. We, we very rarely do we um, have that across our social media or anything publicly facing because I don't want people to look at us and go, oh, look at the poor, struggling, gay, Aboriginal people. Um, cause I don't think anything grows there of any substance. Um, and yeah, so this agency is really important. And that's kind of a, um, throughout all our reports that we're, we co-author and participate in. It's something that we, we ask that this has to be part of it, not just a deficit focus of like, here's some people that need fixing. No, we want to, we're also at the point where we've got solutions as well. Um, in terms of this work, because it's, this is First Nations queer led work as well. Um, the reporting that's come out in the last few years and the research has all been led by First Nations queer folk because no one actually has dived into the data before. Thanks, Jamie. Next slide, please. And look, these um these kind of really go without saying for us. Um, again, you know, these can happen at the same time, or they can happen at different times. Um, there was some research that um, that was part of the queer robbery just before this one, uh, led by Professor Braden Hill, and what they found was that. Um, as First Nations LGBTQTI people, sometimes we actually don't feel comfortable or accepted in the First Nations community or the LGBTQTI community. So we are creating our own sort of community within itself. However, belonging to those groups and, and being part of those groups also provides um, really strong social support networks for ourselves um, because it's not always that within the LGBTQTI community spaces that there's going to be an understanding of who we are as First Nations people, but also in the First Nations community there's not always an understanding of who we are as LGBTQTI people. So we, we are still on this, um, I guess, educational pathway around who we are and where we fit within that. Um, I've just got a popped up a question here um, that's come through. There is a di uh, is there a difference in the stat statistics um, around this work with First Nations LGBTQI people and also First Nations SB? Now, sis SB is sister girl and brother boy, which is essentially trans. Trans people can also be non-binary. Therefore, trans don't Aboriginal trans people don't need to identify as either sister girl or brother boy. So. If you're looking at um, the letters in front of you for the trans community, um, so that includes sister girl and brother boys and non-binary, what we are finding is that the risk is significantly higher, but that that's also mirrored in non-Indigenous communities, when you non-Indigenous LGBTI communities as well with trans populations. We are probably seeing it in, in a hierarchical and the, as the highest risk. Um, I think that it's safe to say that the trans community at First Nations people is one of the, probably the highest um, uh, population group at risk for a whole, not just suicide and self-harm, but a whole raft of um, social issues as well that impact on their lives. Thanks, Damien. And can I remind people, um, any questions you have, just pop them in the Q&A rather than the chat, because then it's easier for us to monitor as we go along. Is that the next slide now, Damien? Um, we just did protective factors. Yeah. So next slide, please. Oh, not me. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, look, these, um, these recommendations are uh, all throughout, uh, are in the report themselves. So you'll be able to get these and, um, and, uh, you know, download them as well afterwards, um, as per the slides, but there are some, um, real practical ways, um, as service providers or as departments, uh, again, some of this, I'm not sure who, um, what agencies or departments or organizations are on the, on the webinar today, but throughout, um, the report and in those recommendations, there are some opportunities for, for both policymakers within government departments, but also those working in organizations and those just wanting to do some practical work as well. Um, 
I think probably the most significant thing is is engage with the training that's available. Um, stuff like queer robbery. Uh, we're quite fortunate to have such a great, uh, fantastic relationship with the um, MHPN for this series, um, and we offer it for free so that more people can engage. Um, and also that we found that uh, attending conferences was actually becoming really restrictive for people. So, you know, coming off the back of a COVID world where everyone um, was equipped with doing virtual engagement, um, this was just really a natural step for us. And we've had over 2,000 people register for this one. Um, so it shows for us that when people want the information and, and that, um, you know, we, it gives us um, confidence to keep going. So engaging with the training, see what's available around. There's very limited, and I think we'll talk about this later on, but there is very limited First Nations LGBTQTI specific um, training that's around. But there's some stuff that you can do on your own. Um, you know, it's around using inclusive language, um, ensuring that your facilities are accessible to all. And that is, again, from the outside looking in. Um, if you're, you're outside your organisation and look at look at it from across the street and go, if you're a First Nations LGBTQTI person, would you walk through that front door? And ask if, they, if you say no, why wouldn't you? Um, don't just grab somebody off the street, but if you do know a First Nations peer person, um, engage with them and ask them, hey, or even create an advisory group for your organisation um, as well to support um, your better your, your service to get a lot stronger in its service delivery. This too will then assist with understanding, particularly in the localised context, um, around some culturally competent care um, that your um, your cohort, I guess, or your, the population that you're serving, um, has access to uh, collaborate and see what um, other organisations are doing the work. If you're, a, I guess, a mainstream organisation, so you're not a LGBTI specific and you're not an Aboriginal specific organisation, uh, draw on those resources around you. If you're an Aboriginal organisation, start conversations with the LGBTI organisations in your area and just ask them what are the, some of the things that they you can do and they may be able to support you as well. Um, if you're, it's NAIDOC week this week, um, if you're, you know, with your celebrations, if you haven't done so also um, already, is include queerness, First Nations, LGBTI people within the work that you do. We've got a couple of other um, uh, sessions this week. We're meeting with Woolworths and also with the New South Wales Legislative Council as part of their NAIDOC work. We do a lot of in-house stuff, um, educating um, organisations and corporate entities around what we do and also um, the work that they could potentially do within their organisations or space as well. I think also the most significant thing is um, be open to change. Um, be open to change, um, come with an open heart and an open mind to this work um, and be also okay and forgiving of yourself for making mistakes. We all make mistakes and not to be fearful of this work. I think that's kind of me for those that bit. Thanks, Jamie. And next slide, please. Oh, so we had already put the next slide up. So we would really like to encourage you, if you're interested, to scan the barcode on the screen and register your interest in joining an MHP and Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander network. And as we spoke about before the webinar started, we're very keen for that to be a, an inclusive one that focuses on, so we don't have, as Damien said before, a separate LGBTI one and a separate um, Aboriginal one or one that we want all this work to be done together. So if you're interested in getting on board and doing that work together uh, with other people in your area, then please uh, scan the barcode and, and get involved through MHPM. Next slide, please. So now we've, we've gone through fairly quickly uh, the report, and obviously we like to do it that way. We've done it in the other queer robberies. Is not spend too much time on the report, just give you a sort of a flavour of it, because obviously you have access to the report to read, and now spend some time answering some questions, some that we received ahead of time and some that are coming in live as we speak. Uh, so I'd like to go to the next slide, please, and ask Damien uh, some questions that came in beforehand. So the first one of these questions that we'd like to think about is how can practitioners help families have conversations about acceptance? I think to start the conversation in a perfect world would be to bring those elements into, I guess, the family unit um, to create a safer space for 
those conversations to have so that's not so direct. Um, it could be something as when Mardi Gras on is actually making a point to sit down and actually watch Mardi Gras and not make a big deal about it with that particular person. Um, making comments, you know, commentary about um, LGBTQTI stuff within within the home. Um, I think then that actually lays a foundation for any other conversation and provides that safer environment as well for that person to feel comfortable. Look, families, I think, are in intrinsically inherently already safe spaces. What happens is that um, the sometimes that as parents unaware that potentially one of their children could be LGBTQTI and therefore language that gets used within their house can come across as being quite discriminatory and also quite hateful. That there will um, place up a barrier um, in terms of your, your family or your young people, your children feeling um, comfortable and accepted. Thanks, Jamie. And further to that, can we go to the next slide, please? Because there's some great resources that Jamie was also going to share with people today around this area of supporting families and supporting young people in families. This here, um, Black Rainbow has been fortunate enough to create a network of support. And The Village is a program that comes out of a queer space in Melbourne. Um, an interesting story, you would have seen on the previous slide, and we'll talk about that merch later, that's some of the Black Rainbow merch. But the Safer Spaces is a workshop that I developed about seven years ago. I rebadged it recently um, under funding from the NTPHN as Safer Spaces. But I delivered that training to Queer Space. And so the biggest learning curve for me was that um, I shouldn't really attempt to educate services that are their businesses, LGBTQTI work around LGBTQTI stuff because I was schooled. But what came out of that was a really great relationship and understanding of what, what Queer Space do. This is one of their programs. Um, it's a program that supports not only um, gender parents of gender diverse or gender non-conforming children, it's also for queer parents or heterosexual children as well. So it actually provides that space of how to be a parent um, as queer parents or parents of queer children. Uh, next slide. I uh, know we're still on the we're still oh, on question yeah. time. <laughs> we're just on, oh, so we we might go back actually to the slide with the resources from David. Yeah. But thanks just so people can see them while we're talking. So someone's asked a question, uh, their internet's dropped in and out, are they going to be able to watch this later on? Absolutely, you have access to the recording later on. Uh, someone's also asked a question, does the research in indicate any differences between experiences of queer mob in remote versus urban areas? I think, uh, yes, and I think it's all about context. Um, different communities, um, in terms of, I guess, in terms of their acceptance, they're going to vary and I would suggest that it's it's largely got to do with how um, how much Christianity is still prevalent within that community and the teachings of Christianity. There are I haven't been to every community in the, in the country, but there are several within the Northern Territory where you hear about this acceptance, particularly of trans um, members. But then you hear of um, where there there isn't that acceptance, and largely this comes down to education. Um, I did um, a, some workshops in the far north Queensland about eight years ago, seven, eight years ago, and I put up the pride flag. This was for an Aboriginal organisation with um, Aboriginal people in the room, or in Torres Strait Islanders in the room. They'd never seen the pride flag before. And that was a real wake up call to me is like, what we are, we have access to in urban centres is not necessarily what everyone has access to in regional remote areas. So we need to be able to take this work out to them to share with them and yes, increase their literacy around this type of and understanding around what is this LGBTQTI. Now on your screen, you'll see two of the things that we the Black Rainbow does. And then also um, I work for myself independent of Black Rainbow, which is the training that I deliver. But with Black Rainbow, we've finally um, finessed um, a suite of um, products that we will be, uh, be going live on our website in the next couple of months. We're just looking for a distributor, um, a place to distribute this. But what we've created is um, a guidebook, which really just is an ex explanatory explanation of those letters that everybody sees and this can get quite confused by. It talks about the importance of pronouns, um, including um, what is cisgender. Um, it has a, a page on you know gender-affirming care, what it is and the need for it, plus also a bit more detail about the village. 
we also created some items that can come within the home. And so that's why um, it was for myself, I live here in the Northern Territory and when we're out barbecuing, I think the number one commodity is a tea towel. So I thought how great would it be to have a tea towel um, with the explanations of what is the LGBTQTI and to go hand in hand with that, there's actually a fridge magnet as well, which has those letters on there. So at home, that can go onto your fridge. People will see those letters and go ask, what do they mean? There's a tea towel nearby that can explain that. Um, we've also done um, some playing cards and these, um, you know, for, for snap, memory and fish, there's a barcode on the back um, for those to take to the instructions. Plus we'd have some badges and also a tote bag. So we've just slowly um, been doing some, get some really informal community-based market research around how this is accepted. Um, it's very much so. Um, now we're just under the pump to ensure that we can have somewhere to distribute it. The Safer Spaces workshop is the workshop that I've been running now for about seven years. Um, this here is organizational training, workforce development. Um, currently I'm doing it within the Northern Territory, um, contracted on the Northern Territory Primary Health Network. Um, it's only available at this stage in person, not online. Um, but this training as well, just is, is that workforce development, is that organizational training around one, what, why do you need to be doing this training? Why do you need to be aware of First Nations queer people um, in your, I guess, your environment and why they need to be accessing your services and some tips of how to do that? Thanks, Damien. Uh, uh, questions come in uh, on the chat asking about uh, resources in New South Wales, separate from ACON. Uh, are there not there not not really a lot of resources available for supporting queer mobs? So, what are some resources you might suggest in that space? Um, hopefully, us uh, once we yeah. get our stuff available, because we are we are unfunded as well. Um, we're unwaged or unfunded, and part of our business model is to create merchandise for people to that pay for it. Um, so that's individuals and organisations, and so that money then goes back into resourcing us to be able to do the work that needs to be done we we believe and so we do have a we have some real generic stuff at the moment that you can download and i think that's just the calendar for the year and that just adds to the visibility um but we will be um hopefully within the next two months once we find a distributor have these resources available these will also be extended towards um if you can see these um we've done up cards with um our characters on them and also the definition on the back. So this is um, Ricky. Uh, I'm just going to go here. This is Ricky. And on the back is a definition of intersex. Uh, we have Joyce. Um, theirs is asexual and non binary. So we'll have all these as well available. And what we're looking at doing is packaging these as a set for organizations to have in their waiting room um, so that folks can um, see them. We'd, we'd be very specific in on the, the colors that we choose, the the font, the imagery. It's all come really has come from, you know, what's going to catch people's eyes. But we are looking to have those available to buy as packs, as information resources, particularly for, um, I think, uh, Aboriginal organizations. There hasn't been a lot of this type of conversation outside of ACOM, which has been is historically an AIDS organization or a HIV organization, organization. And so they're, they're not as equipped with this type of stuff or as in tune to what First Nations people need. Thanks, Jamie. So another question that we had ahead of time was what engagement techniques best create safety and connection when you're first engaging with a client who is LGBTQ and First Nations? Um, be respectful. <laughs> um, <laughs> be respectful. Uh, I think one of the things, I think the biggest thing is to not have, um, be fearful of your engagement. Treat them as you would treat really anybody else. And I say that in terms of is honouring who they are, honouring who they are as a First Nations person, honouring who they are as an LGBTQTI person. And some of it does come down to, um, you know, just be really mindful of any potential accidental racism or homophobia or transphobia. And that comes down to education, you know, understanding how is it best to, um, you know, to not behave in a racist manner, but also not to make assumptions. Um, we are quite a diverse uh, group as First Nations people. Um, not all of us will, 
we all have varying degrees, I guess, of um, cultural connection. And when I say cultural connection, this is in regards to the day-to-day activities. Like for myself, um, I don't speak language, I don't live on country. So my connection to um, some of the behaviours that maybe for someone who's regional and more remote will be different. So it's just to really be mindful, I think, particularly as thera- therapists, um, is how we would normally, and I have a social work background, um, and how you would normally engage with a client is have an understanding of who they are and then be able to progress around your engagement with them. But I think, you know, for the most part, we are human beings like everybody else with the same needs, desires and wants. Um, don't be fearful of this, um, all the first sessions LGBTQI that were from some other planet and therefore it's going to be super challenging. Thanks, Amy. We've had a few different questions come in. I think there's still a little bit of uncertainty or lack of clarity about why we talk about sister girls and brother boys distinct from the T as trans within LGBTIQ. Would you like to talk a little bit more about that sort of historical and cultural meaning of sister girls and brother boys? Yeah, the... <laughs> For where we've landed as Black Rainbow through um, talking with um, our community members, I'm based here in the Northern Territory. Uh, some of our leadership group is in New South Wales, in Queensland. Where we came to, and we've got, um, I think, on our website, um, even what we use on our tea towel, when we describe or define sister girl and brother boy, it's socially and culturally accepted language um, to define or to describe a transgender um, Aboriginal person, if that's how they describe. Not all trans people, trans Aboriginal people, even trans people identify under the binary of man or woman. Some of them do define as non-binary. But the separation from that is the language that's used in community um, in regards to who they are as a as a key more as an identifier, I guess, outside of simply being trans or being gay. Um, and but also it carries with it outside of those communities with it, I guess, a more of an inherent understanding that they they do come with that dual identity of being First Nations as well, as well as trans. Excuse me. Thanks, Damien. And I think, you know, we've had a few questions that came in earlier uh, before the webinar today about suicidality. And I think, you know, given the topic of today's uh, webinar, it's really important to talk a bit more about that. And obviously that's your background as a suicidologist. Um, just, just, just think or unpack a bit more about what does suicidality look like within queer First Nations communities and perhaps compared to non-First Nations queer communities and what does that mean for the clinical work that people are doing? Um, just want to ask you, in terms of suicidality, do you mean in terms of what are the, the warning signs or...? <laughs> I think people are interested in the whole picture, the warning signs, how does it, and what are the responses that you might take and if someone uh, presenting with suicidal yeah. ideation or self-harm. I think in the first instance that if somebody is presenting that way, it's providing them free from harm from themselves and also from others, and that you'll be able to facilitate that within your own environments, how you've done for somebody else. Uh, the behaviours are, are largely the same. The, the reasons behind it, the... the the, the, the behaviours are nuanced and different, but they do manifest in a lot of in similar ways. So it is um, what you would see in a First Nations person or even in a non, non-First Nations or an LGBTI, non-LGBTI, the, the suicide-related behaviours are quite um, similar. Um, within, we have the research doesn't, hasn't yet gone into the level of out in remote communities, how does that look like for First Nations queer folk? But the disassociation or disconnecting, um, the isolation, the, um, you know, there is one of the things that I've, um, that through my research or through my studies, um, during the Masters of Suicidology is that there is, there is like, uh, oh, there is an unknown quantum of risk factors that exist. Um, it's the key thing around understanding about risk factors is more about how they interact with a person at a particular time when they're at this, when they're in distress. Um, th- when you look at um, what are suicide risk factors, losing a job is a risk factor for suicide. So is it, and for me, I think, okay, then in the practical sense, does that mean that people should never be fired? Because that becomes a risk factor. So it is really understanding what's going on for that person at that moment. Be aware though, like as a first station LGBTQI people, some of those triggers and um 
uh, those yeah, well, triggers for that behavior or those thinking could come th- be experienced as a First Nations person, or they could be being experienced as an LGBTQI person, or as someone who is experiencing both. And I think related to that, I think people would like to hear a bit more about, and obviously you're one person speaking, you can't speak for all First Nations people, but how do communities respond? How is suicidality thought about within First Nations communities, particularly with regards to queer mob? There are over 240 communities. Yeah. <laughs> 240 discrete. Um, what I'm finding, I mean, I've, I've moved back home to the Northern Territory. I grew up here and it's a different landscape to when I grew up. I left this town because I didn't feel accepted. Um, and I thought this is this um, outback town is not somewhere where I want to, where I, want to, where I can be queer with any kind of degree of safety. Um, it comes down to education. The more, the greater the education in these in these communities, the greater levels of acceptance, um, and that just makes perfect. That makes perfect sense. So it is around getting this information out there. I'm quite fortunate when I when I started working for myself nearly a decade ago. Um, I ensured that, and having worked in regional remote areas for quite a while, knowing that you know a lot of organisations, if not all, shut outside of Monday to Friday nine to five, that. I would be offering my services, and I'm not clinical, this is just around training, seven days a week. So if there's in regional remote areas where people can't access any training until the weekend, I'll make myself available um, for that. But it is around ensuring that the getting the information, because the more people are armed with information, they can make better decisions. Um, and also it, this the what I've also found, we found through our market research with our with our product at Black Rainbow, it's not just First Nations communities who see those letters and go, what the hell does that mean? And what do we do next? Um, so we're finding that it's also non-Indigenous folk who uh, looking at the work that we're doing here around this explanatory stuff and saying, wow, we would love access to that as well. So, And they can. <laughs> and I think a lot of what to me is really coming out of today is that sort of need for a holistic approach. You know, we know that that families are, if families are supportive, then that sort of reduces the risk of that impact of racism and homophobia that might be coming from outside of the family. But of course, if the family doesn't know about suicidality or has misconceptions about suicidal ideation or doesn't know how to listen or isn't accepting of their children, then there's going to, that, that, that safety net isn't there. So it is about bringing this sort of, and I think this is what Crew Robbery has been doing from the first webinar onwards to today, is bringing together that holistic image of we need all of these things to be working in collaboration with one another. It's not just silos, individual things. We actually need the whole thing to come together to sort of mitigate suicidal, suicidal risk and responding when there is risk. Look, absolutely. And in queer, robbery, queer robbery also was born out of the fact that we didn't have our policymakers or government departments doing any of this work. So we thought, you know what, we're going to do it. We're not going to wait for the policy to come out. We're just going to do it. And I think, you know, this being our third one and over 2,000 registrations, I think Julie said there's like 2,400 or something, and I maybe flexing a little bit and saying being more than what there actually was. But this speaks to the need that there are people that are interested in this information um, and they're, they're recognising that this information is essential to the work that they do. One of the key things around queer robbery and also being available virtually plus also online afterwards is in regional remote areas, access to this information is now a lot more easy because that is going to be available online. Um, once upon a time, you did have to get on a plane and go to a conference and spend thousands of dollars. You don't have to do that anymore, not for this stuff anyway. Um, we offer this for free. This is what our donations go into, is into create, be able to facilitate and pay for free education um, for folk. Thanks, Damien. And we've had another probably the most beautiful question I think I've ever had on any of the MHM, PM, MHPM webinars I've ever facilitated. It comes from a young person who's 11, they're non-binary and they're watching with their mum. And they've said, um, are Aboriginal children accepted for being fluid like this? Will they like Aboriginal people like trans people who are not Aboriginal to be their friends so they don't want to hurt themselves? Absolutely. Yeah, especially that last bit as well. Um, I think for myself, I'm not trans or non-binary, but I, as a young gay kid, I think that I would have liked to have and know other gay kids. 
<laughs> what a beautiful question. Um, I've forgotten the first half because the second half just kind of knocked the wind out of me, Damien. Um, <laughs> I think it's about acceptance and people caring if you feel like you might want to hurt yeah. yourself. I think you know, we see it in our families, um, and I, I, I travel quite a bit throughout the Northern Territory. Um, I've done a few laps now between um, Ayers Rock and Darwin, and the families there intrinsically are already loving and safe. Um, and this is around that an extra layer that can come through um, through the information, through knowledge. Um, some families are more across this than others, and it really comes down to be able to have them to understand who their child is um, and how to love them even more. Yeah. Hmm. And obviously we've got, you know, 24 hour um, helplines such as 13 Yarn, but people have also asked questions around, is there anything special that you would want people watching today to know in terms of how to approach safety plans for suicidality for um, LGBTI mob? Well, um, one, the work hasn't been done in terms of what they would actually look like. Um, I, um, and I can't, I don't want to speak with any kind of authority of what they should look like. I think it's making best of what you have. And if it was me, it would be looking at what elements do I need to be able to bring in from both a LGBTI or a First Nations element and create, bring something together there. Um, but I can't speak with any kind of authority on that and that's based on any research. Um, that would be making the best with what you've got. But it, it, what it, that does do is it signifies and signals that you know, this work is important because if practitioners are asking for this stuff, then something does need to be developed um, as a guide around that. And I think it comes back to what we were speaking about before. It's about a holistic approach. It's about what are the multiple factors that might be impacting upon queer mob rather than going, well, I'm going to do a bit on this and then in a separate thing, I'm going to do an assessment on this. It's about how do we have this holistic conversation that looks at the multiple factors that are likely to impact suicidality for queer mob. Yeah, no, it's a long time. This guy's been, you know, over 20 years since I did any casework. And one of the things that was always embedded in me is, the person that you're working with is going to be the expert in their lives. So that information is largely going to come from them. They, uh, it's, they may be, not be able to articulate it in a way that is clear, but they may say it in a way that can give you some signs um, or lead you in directions to explore further because they might not have the language either as to why um, they're feeling that way, but also they might not have the language to say, this behaviour that I'm engaging in is because of this. Um, they may not be able to draw those links up as well. Yeah, and I think someone's, again, someone's just uh, made a point that I think you made earlier, which is there are lots of similarities. We're, we're running this Queer Robbery series to focus on the specificities of what it means to be LGBTIQA plus and First Nations. But we also want to acknowledge, as Damien said before, that a lot of these things are similar across groups as well. So we're not saying there's necessarily exceptionalism going on that there's entirely unique ways of experiencing suicidality suicidality for queer mob but we are also wanting to acknowledge the specific factors that are impacting on queer mob so it's a bit of both that i think is going on here and, and someone just made that point which i think is an excellent point yeah and it's, it's it's this the real one of the other I mean, thing is many purposes now for queer robbery but it's around identifying that as a population group at significant risk, so at greater risk um, than First Nations people who are non-LGBTI and at greater risk than LGBTI people who aren't First Nations. So um, when in your, if you're in your service delivery, um, if your organisation doesn't have a client base that is First Nations LGBTQTI, um, perhaps look at the ways in which you could strengthen your public facing identity um, so that those folk feel comfortable enough to walk through your door. That's as a, um, an Aboriginal medical service or a mainstream organisation or as an LGBTI organisation. And that, Perfect, I mean, that was a question that just came through asking, you know, we have services out here and we think that these services are, they're notionally funded to be available to LGBTI people slash First Nations people, but people aren't walking through the door. And so what Damien has just spoken about is this is maybe the things that are stopping people walking through the door. Is the signage clear? Are people getting the responses they need? The service might be funded to work with those communities, but are they getting the service responses they need? 
think of I, I think think of your organization as a business and um and not to try and bring capitalism into this world into this space but your business is, is needs to have customers and if you don't have customers coming through your front door you need to advertise and promote yourself um for a customer base so if and if you're finding that you're not reaching you know the, the most or you know um, a diverse customer base you think well hang on we haven't got a lot of men coming through here we need to start advertising so that men will come in and purchase our products not just women and vice versa think of your service like that so if your service is for everybody and everybody isn't coming through that front door you need to work out okay what do we need to do to ensure that everybody does come in through and access those services yeah, excellent, I mean, uh, We're getting towards the end of question time. There's a few more questions that I think we could touch on usefully around, again, suicidality, which is our focus today, and people are very interested in. Uh, people are interested in uh, training around identifying warning signs for queer mob, and there are also people are also interested in supports available for family members of people who are, who are, pot are potentially bereaved by suicide. Read by suicide from of First Nations LGBTQI. Or? Yeah, yeah. When a family member has passed from suicide, we um, we have a close relationship with Queer Space. Um, I we on our um, on our socials we direct people towards Queer Space, and the reason I, we do that is they also provide support to people um, pre COVID virtually. So there's actually people also outside of um, outside of Victoria. Um, your local health service, I imagine, should have um, some kind of um, bereavement support. Um, I know I'm not too sure if there is a, the Aboriginal National one still operates. I, it's a long time since I've come up for air from working out in remote communities, but um, locally there should be some kind of support network, whether through an Aboriginal health service, the LGBTI, or through a mainstream one. If you have a PHN, a primary health network in your region, I would give them a call because um, they would also probably have a good idea around and perhaps even fund a service like that in your area. Thanks, Damien, and thanks everyone for all the wonderful questions that came in before the webinar and all the wonderful ones that came in during the webinar today. Obviously, we can't get through all of them. Uh, it's not possible, but hopefully the resources that Damien has provided that you can access by clicking on the three buttons gives you some more uh, avenues to explore for resources you might access and obviously link in with Black Rainbow and with MHPN. And again, consider getting involved in creating a, a, a local area network around working with First Nations people. So can we please go to the beginning of the wrap up slides? Thank you very much. Uh, before we move on to these, I'd just like to ask if Damien has any quick thing you'd like to say in summary to wrap up, you know, what you've talked about today. Yeah, well, thanks, Damien, and um, thanks to the um, MHPN again for you know facilitating and support and supporting us in the work that we want to do. Something that um, Black Rainbow has been quite um, hands on with in doing doing our part um, is I'm not too sure if people are aware there is a referendum coming up later this year. Um, Black Rainbow has committed to supporting um, the yes vote. Um, we think that it, we believe, and this is drawn on our own unique experiences as First Nations people, as First Nations LGBTQI people. I certainly bring to this, um, to guess, to my decision about this over 20 years of working in service delivery in regional and remote areas. It's the best chance that we've ever had as First Nations people to speak directly to governments around what it is that we need. Um, I don't see the voice as an advisory group. I see it as a really str strong information centre. Um, I think that there's been too much focus on the word advisory, that people can ignore that. But if you provide people with evidence, you provide people with information, um, I think that carries a lot more weighting. But also for First Nations queer folk, we believe this is going to be the this, this will be the very first time that as first nations lgbtqti people we will have direct contact with government at the moment we are funneled up through the aboriginal health sector which seems doesn't really include us in their health work um, at a national level and also in the lgbti stuff as well um, we're not included in there you can look across the lgbti um, health frameworks or the research we're not evident so this gives us an opportunity to be able to speak directly to government and say hey 
this is what we also need, this is what's going on. Um, so I would really um, encourage people to, you know, not just to vote yes, but understand what they're voting for. And we know that as people anyway, that decisions about us are always best made when we're actually part of the solution and um, can share with what we need. Thanks, Jamie. That's beautifully said. Next slide, please. So it was a real pleasure. I'm not sure if all of the 2,000 plus people who registered attended today, but hopefully you will all get a chance to watch. If you didn't, uh, the, the, this webinar has been recorded and you will receive information from HPN very soon about how to access that recording. We would very much appreciate it if you would complete the uh, feedback survey, survey so we know what we're doing well and what we could do better. And we've certainly had wonderful feedback on the previous two queer robbery webinars. You'll also receive uh, your statement of attendance if that's useful for you in your workplace. And we really hope that you'll continue engaging with the work of queer robbery as it comes up. We have another uh, webinar for queer robbery coming up in September this year. So stay tuned for information about that. Uh, we also have other webinars coming up through the MHM and PM, which might be really important for you. And again, there's a QR code here that you can scan for that information. So we've got one on supporting um, patients with PTSD. We've got an emerging mind one on infant and parent mental health coming up in August. And then we've got another one in August coming up on latest innovations uh, to looking at trauma-informed care. So the MHM and PM is always doing amazing work. It's um, Excellent if you're on their mailing list to continue to receive that information so that you know what's coming up and it's always free. So it's always an excellent resource to share within your networks and within your communities. Next slide, please. There's also amazing, uh, the MHPN doesn't just run webinars, they also offer other amazing resources for people and, and included in that is podcasts. And so they have a three part series available on emergency workers, which I think is an amazing topic to be talking about. And I think it's a very pressing topic here in Australia where we have lots of conversations about things like ramping. Uh, so what does it mean for people to be doing that work? And I think it's amazing that the, the MHPN has a, a podcast series on that. And certainly another one that's very key uh, and salient to today's uh, webinar is a conversation about Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people, climate change and COVID-19. And I think, you know, you may not think of those topics as easily going together, but if you pause for a moment and reflect, I think First Nations people have a lot to say about the effects of climate change um, since colonisation onwards. So I'm sure that's a really exciting podcast series for you to listen to. Um, obviously, the focus on COVID-19 sits very well with the uh, first queer robbery that Damien explored his research on the impact of COVID-19 on Indigenous LGBTIQA plus people. Next slide, please. So we're very fortunate that the MHPN across Australia supports over 350 networks. And obviously we're inviting you here today to put your hand up and signal that you might be interested in helping form another network that would focus on First Nations people with, an, of course, a focus on LGBTIQA plus people. So we'd really encourage you to, to visit the MHPN network to talk about finding out what networks are available already. I know here in South Australia, we have a a gender and sexuality diversity one that you can join and these are everywhere but also whether you're interested in starting a new network so obviously reaching out to the OHPN scan the barcode code and, and and begin those conversations which can you know take many different forms it can be you being part of your own organization starting that it might be other colleagues that you work with there's so many routes to forming those networks and the MHPN is is fantastically resourced source to help you uh, do that work and, and start those uh, networks. So fantastic opportunities available for everyone. Last slide, please. So before I close, I'd really like to acknowledge the lived experience, people and carers who have lived with mental illness in the past and those who continue to live with mental illness in the present. Thank you to everyone who joined us today. Thank you especially to Damien Bonson for the amazing work that he's doing through Black Rainbow. Thank you to Maddie Day for, for leading the project that, that, that uh, Damien spoke about today. And, and thank you to everyone for your amazing questions and especially the young person who joined with their mum today and asked us that beautiful question. Thank you everyone and enjoy the rest of your day.